Hi, and welcome back to another edition of Easy Theory. So today we're going to continue from where we left off in our lecture series. So we've been talking about these things called NFAs. And what the N stands for, of course, is non-deterministic. So here, of course, we can have a state with a bunch of transitions on the same symbol if we want to. We can have some that have an epsilon transition. We can have some that uh, are missing that involve some other symbol if we want to. And at the other end, we have DFAs, where it, the D here actually stands for deterministic. So here, we can't have epsilon transitions at all. Every um, character has to appear at least once, let's just say A and B in this case. So there must be an A and a B transition, and there can't be, for example, uh, another A transition. So... The question is, well, what, what is the relationship between DFAs and NFAs? Well, DFAs, we know how to solve some problems with them. NFAs, we can actually solve a lot more problems with them. We can solve the concatenation problem. We can solve the star problem. So, and we can actually do, um, we can solve a bunch of different languages a lot more simply using NFAs compared to DFAs, such as, um, all the strings that contain, say, 101 as a substring. Uh, NFAs are really easy for that, whereas DFAs, you actually have to think about it. So the question is, well, what is the relationship between the two here? Well, clearly, every DFA is already an NFA because the machine doesn't have to be non-deterministic if it's an NFA. It doesn't have to be, but it's just it allow it's allowed to. So we know that we have we have a DFA. If we have a DFA, we already have an NFA. So that's not too surprising there. So the question here is, can we get from an arbitrary NFA, which could have epsilon transitions, missing transitions, multiple transitions, can we take such an NFA and convert it to an equivalent DFA? Well, I can't just take the machine and say, yeah, that's the DFA, because it may have epsilon transitions and multiple and missing transitions and all that stuff. So what we want to be able to do is, if there is such a relationship here, well, what we would need to do is to find some type of algorithm. So if there is such a process, so if there is such a process at all, is there an algorithm to do it, to actually perform the conversion. Because remember, the whole idea of whether something, a language is regular or not, is whether a DFA actually exists for the language. We don't have to actually provide the explicit DFA, but rather we just have to assert its existence. We could say, well, there is a process that does this conversion, but it may be that we just don't have an algorithm for it. But it would be really nice, oops, it'd be really nice if there really is an algorithm to do the conversion for us. So there's a couple steps in actually showing that this is true. So a theorem that we'll prove is that NFAs are equivalent to DFAs. And we're going to not prove that here today, but we're going to introduce something um, that helps us along with the proof. So it's something called epsilon closure. So what does it really mean? Well, suppose that we have an NFA right here. And let's just say that we have a bunch of states, and let's just say we have some epsilon, maybe that's a start state, and we have some epsilon transitions, maybe this is an A here, epsilon here, and then B here, let's just say. And I'm going to call this Q0, Q1, Q2, and Q3. So what do we notice here? Well, let's just say that we're tasked to actually convert this thing into an equivalent DFA. It's obviously not a DFA because there, it breaks every rule in the rule book here. So what do we want to do? What we want to do is to say, well, okay, well, we got to make a start state of the DFA no matter what, and we got to emulate the behavior of what the NFA would have done. Well, suppose that we're in the start state of the NFA here. Well, 
without reading any characters, where else can we go from the start state? Well, we can go over to Q1 if we want to and stop there. Or we can take go to Q1 and then to Q3 if we want to because those just involve two epsilon transitions here. Or we can go from Q0 to Q2 if we wanted to. But the point is that from this Q0 state, we can go to any of these other states if uh, purely based on the fact that we can take these epsilon transitions without reading anything. So that's actually what epsilon closure is all about. It's saying we're taking the closure, so to speak, of this state with respect to the epsilon transitions. So what is the epsilon closure? It's the smallest uh, subset of, of Q, the set of states, such that we have one, um, let's just call the subset X. So X contains the original set. I'll explain what that is in a second. And two, uh, there is no epsilon transition uh, from uh, some state little x in big X to a state Y, which is not in X. So there's no transition that goes inside of this subset X that we're making here from a state inside to a state outside. So what, is, what in the world does that mean? Well, let's just take this, um, this NFA right here. Well, the set that I'm originally starting with is this Q0 state right here. Maybe I'll do it in a, a solid uh, circle so it's easier to remove. So the blue circle is where I'm currently listing states in. Well, we got to start including other states in this set X because we're taking the epsilon closure of this state. Well, really, we're really talking about a set of states here. So epsilon closure is generalized to you start with any set of states and you include more states depending on whether you can take epsilon transitions. So we see that there's an epsilon transition, this one right here, that goes from a state inside this set X to a state outside the set X. So that means to us that the set X is incomplete. So then what we need to do is to include Q1 into our set right here. Cool. Well, then we see, okay, well, there is a state Q0 that has an epsilon transition to a state outside the set X right here. So then now what we're going to do is include Q2 in our set X. And then again, we see a transition from a state Q1, which is inside the blue circle, to a state that's outside the blue circle. So we're going to include this end state also in the set X. Okay, so we have, then we're going to have all four states in there. Okay, so what we can say here is that the epsilon closure of the state Q0 is all four of these states. And the way that we're going to write this is E of the set containing Q0. So what does this mean? The E here means epsilon closure. And the Q0 here is the set of states that we are starting with. So we're just starting with a single state, so that's why we have a set containing one thing in there. So then what this will give us is the set X that is mentioned right here. And what is the set X in this case? Well, we have determined that it's all four of these states right here. So that is the set Q0, Q1, Q2, Q3. So why would you want such a thing? Well, we got to have the original set of states because, remember, epsilon transitions are completely optional. You do not have to take them. So in this Q0 state, if I wanted to, I can just stay there if I wanted to. It doesn't really help us with this machine, but we could if we wanted to. 
So that's why the Q0 is included right here because it's in the original set right here. Well then we include all these other states because those are reachable in some sense from the original set right here via some number of epsilon transitions. Okay, so one thing that we should clarify is, well, suppose that we have this set of states X right here, and let's just say that we have a, a state S right here that has an epsilon transition into X, which uh, to a state Y or something, which is in X. Well, should we include S in the epsilon closure uh, which is the set X that we're maintaining right here, the blue bubble that we were doing before? And the answer is no, because it may not necessarily be that S is reachable via epsilon transitions only from a state inside X. So the key here to understand is that we only will include a state if the epsilon closure goes outside of the set X, not going into the set X. Okay? Because it's not necessarily the case that we can reach this state S via epsilon transitions only. So I hope that was interesting. Leave a comment below if you were able to um, find any other interesting NFAs with interesting epsilon closures in there. As always, please like and subscribe to the channel. And as always, I'll see you next time.